Hello, and welcome to Breast Cancer Conversations, a podcast brought to you by survivingbreastcancer.org. I'm Laura Carfing, breast cancer survivor and founder of survivingbreastcancer.org, a nonprofit organization providing community, education, and resources to empower those diagnosed with breast cancer and their caregivers from day one and beyond. Hello, hello, my friends. Thank you for joining us for yet another episode of Breast Cancer Conversations. If you are a longtime listener, welcome back. I am so glad you're here. And if this is your first time joining our Breast Cancer Conversations community, I am welcoming you with open arms and a big hug. As you know, we are in the throes of Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and as this podcast is being recorded and coming out, I thought we would have some time to bring together an amazing panel of those diagnosed with early stage breast cancer, as well as those living with metastatic breast cancer, to really talk about what October means to us, how we can use this month for education, for action, for lobbying and advocacy work. Some of us identify with the color pink, and we will proudly wear pink, pink sashes, pink boas, pink ribbons. Others of us really understand that Breast Cancer Awareness Month goes well beyond just awareness. When you look at the month of October, October 13th is the National Metastatic Breast Cancer Awareness Day. But what about all the other 30 days of October. We could utilize this opportunity to educate on breast health in general, whether you have breast cancer or not, and we can advocate for and discuss and educate around metastatic breast cancer. Today's podcast is made possible because of donors like you, our listeners, as well as our two sponsors for Breast Cancer Awareness Month, one being Amona. USA and the other one being Madam Glam. I will link to all of their websites and their October promotional opportunities in the show notes below. And if this is your first time listening and you're not familiar with survivingbreastcancer.org, I do want to let you know that each week we have a lot of programs and services offered for free for our breast cancer community. So let me give you that quick rundown. Every Thursday night, we have our Thursday Night Thrivers Meetup and specifically save the date for October 14th, where we will be having our metastatic breakout room for those living with MBC. Every Monday, we have Movement Monday classes, including yoga, Pilates. Coming up, we also have an amazing writing workshop, Writing as Healing. Every other Sunday, we have our MBC webinar series, which is live on our Facebook page as well as the first Sunday of every month is our Breast Cancer Book Club, where we read books that have absolutely nothing to do with breast cancer, plus so much more. So be sure to hop on over to survivingbreastcancer.org forward slash events to get the daily. Awareness is a form of advocacy. With this whole breast cancer awareness, they don't tell you, like specifically call out like the different subtypes that there are. When it came back nine years later, I had a completely different opinion of the... uh, Pink October. It was irritating. It was annoying. It had absolutely nothing to do with me. People had no idea what metastatic cancer was. They still don't. Pink isn't switching from treatment to treatment to treatment like I do. Pink isn't having to wear this wig all the time. We need to have an awareness, but not maybe the whole month of awareness of breast cancer, but maybe a little more awareness of what metastatic cancer is, because that's the only one that actually kills us. Welcome to the conversation. For me, the bottom line is that this month is full of triggers and full of emotion and full of things that don't seem significant objectively, but that when you add in the emotions of having dealt with breast cancer, whether early stage or beginning at stage four, it should get, it just gets complicated. So the first question I want to ask everybody on the panel is uh, some demographic information so we can kind of center us all where we're coming from. Presently, I am 42, but I was 38 at my de novo metastatic diagnosis, which means I was diagnosed metastatic out of the gate, never um, dealt with early stage disease, even though I was misdiagnosed for a few months. And I am living and currently in Miami, Florida with some dear friends. Um, I'm Stephanie Walker. I am 62 years old. I was diagnosed at the age of 56, uh, metastatic breast cancer de novo. Um, not an opportunity for the early stage. And the, anyway, we'll get that. Um, so I live in Eastern North Carolina, but was diagnosed and my primary treatment was done in Louisiana. Diagnosed in 2015. I'm sorry. Um, so that is what, six years ago. 
and stable and the last five. So here I am. I'm Victoria Goldberg. I'm, God, I don't want to say this, but I'm 61 years old. Um, I'm currently, I think it's Hollywood. Is it Hollywood, Florida? But I live in uh, New York City. And I was diagnosed at 43 with uh, stage one, triple positive breast cancer. And uh, after all the treatments that you had to go for uh, aggressive disease, I had a nine year break. And then lo and behold, I had the progression to my liver in 2014. And I've been living with this disease for eight years now, almost eight years. I'm Christy Conser, diagnosed in 2012 when I was 41, straight out of the gate, metastatic. I reside in Wisconsin, but am spending some time with my healing group. Hey, everyone. I'm Megan Claire Chase. A lot of people know me as Warrior Megzi in the cancer community. I am the early stager here. Though I do not have NBC, I say yet, because uh, you just never know. I am here to uh, kind of talk from that perspective and what I've learned. Um, but I am. I was diagnosed in um, September 2000. 2015 with stage 2a invasive lobular breast cancer and i'm in atlanta georgia my name is janice and i am um, actually living with metastatic triple negative breast cancer since 2016 i was once an early stage breast cancer i was stage one triple negative Right after my uh, 54th birthday, I was diagnosed with stage one TNBC completed treatment and got to about five years and uh, discovered that I was metastatic. Um, I am very fortunate. I had a complete response to my first line of treatment in 2016, and I have remained no evidence of disease for almost five years now. I'm originally from the Midwest, grew up in Indiana, raised our kids in Ohio, but for the last 15 years, we've resided in Florida, and I'm now on the West Coast. I'm Eileen, and I reside in California, but I am currently in my hometown of Miami. I was diagnosed de novo, estrogen and um, progesterone receptor positive. Um, from the start in 2015, March 2015. So I'm going into my seventh year. So you can see we've got people from different areas of the United States, um, people with different um, experiences in terms of their subtype or whether or not they had early stage and then progressed to, to a stage four diagnosis. The first question that I want to throw out to the two people with early stage disease first is, what did you know about breast cancer awareness or breast cancer awareness month before your early stage diagnosis. And I'm going to throw that to you first, Meg. So before diagnosis, I just thought, oh, it's just breast cancer. And, you know, check yourself every month and you're good to go. There's lots of paint, lots of walks, lots of smiles. It, it never occurred to me that it was um, difficult. Um, it looks fun. Uh, and let's just say that's no longer my view. <laughs> so you heard the hype or the, the positivity and uplifting, this is the quote unquote easy cancer type of narrative. How did that change after you were diagnosed with early stage cancer? I mean, well, it was even just trying to get diagnosed because my symptoms are not typical. Um, of what they often tell you that you should look for. And so my symptoms were dismissed. Um, it took two years before I finally got the diagnosis and it was only when I felt it is when everything started to like roll. And I was like, what's a diagnostic mammogram? Like all of a sudden I'm hearing all these terms, I'm hearing all these things. And I'm like, wait a minute, shouldn't we become aware? And then when they said I had invasive lobular, I was like, I have invasive, what? Like no one ever with this whole breast cancer awareness, they don't tell you like specifically call out like the different subtypes that there are. And honestly, all I kept hearing was, oh my God, just get your breasts chopped off. You'll be fine. You'll be good. And when I started in with my 
you know, journey. And I even hate to use that word sometimes. I was like, this is really complicated. I, I literally, like I, I was like, for me, my cancer didn't necessarily almost kill me. It was the toxic treatments. And then when I realized, hey, because I was diagnosed under 40 um, and we're called uh, young adults when you're diagnosed under 40. And when my um, breast cancer surgeon and plastic surgeon, they're like, we can save your breasts. And I'm under the assumption, no, you got to remove them. That's what they say in all the commercials. And they were like, no, that's not true. And so I listened to the facts and I, it was a deeply personal decision. I've actually been surgery shamed for getting a lumpectomy instead of a double mastectomy because it was at that moment, the more information I received and doing more, of course, on my own too, I was like, wait a minute, this doesn't just mean it goes away. This doesn't mean that I can never become metastatic. And I never even heard of the term metastatic until I had officially, like when I was halfway through with my cancer experience. So a lot of the lack of information, the lack of specific information you found out after your experience initially. I, everything you're saying, Megan, totally resonates with me as like the early stage where I too was diagnosed under 40. I didn't really know much about cancer in general, let alone breast cancer. Um, you know, I think it does get a lot of attention with the walks. I just feel like there's a lot of like you know, pink boas everywhere. Everyone's looking smiling and happy and, you know, empowered, which, you know, rightly so, you know, I kind of say to each his own, do what do you. And if that works with a pink sash that says survivor, that's great. It doesn't work for everybody. Ironically, prior to my diagnosis, I had a colleague who was diagnosed with breast cancer. And I remember her telling me, um, oh, I'm just going to have a lumpectomy. I don't need a mastectomy. And I was like, oh, okay, that's good. In, sen in the sense of like, I don't even know what these words mean. I literally had to go back to my office and Google what is the difference between a lumpectomy and a mastectomy because these, they were not part of my vocabulary. And then shortly thereafter, I was diagnosed with breast cancer as well. And I don't know if this was your experience too, Megan, but not having gone through any sort of screening before because I was under 40 with no family history or risk. I just thought it was normal. I thought it was normal to do the diagnostic images, getting multiple images on both sides of my breast, as well as going from the the mammography to the ultrasound. I was like, oh, they're just being super thorough. Everyone gets this. Not even connecting the dots that there was um, a reason to be concerned. Uh, Victoria, tell us about your experience with um, Breast Cancer Awareness Month before your early stage diagnosis. Yeah, so it's interesting. I'm I'm here to represent both groups. I like that. Uh, so before I was diagnosed metastatic and I, uh, early stage, and I have to say that I don't quite remember if there was uh, uh, the awareness month in 2004. I think it was, but I'm not sure. I paid no attention to breast cancer at all because I figured, you know, no breast, has, no breast cancer history in my family, which is true. So um, I don't have to worry about it. So this is how much we know about breast cancer, right? So when I was diagnosed with early stage, I, uh, and after my treatment, I actually, and so I guess there was because, because I participated in one of the Coleman walks and I, uh, I had a team that I put together at, um, at uh, Bear Stearns, the place I worked at the time. And I was so proud of myself. I was so proud that I survived this breast cancer. And I was so certain that that's exactly what happened, that I, I had my treatments. I was finished, done. That's it. Finished over. Uh, but when it came back nine years later, I had a completely different opinion of the uh, Pink October. It was irritating. It was annoying. It had absolutely nothing to do with me. People had no idea what metastatic cancer was. They still don't. At this point, I feel everybody is aware of breast cancer. There isn't a single person in the world who is not. And by the way, mammograms did not find my cancer. So, so many of us with aggressive types of cancer our cancer is not found by mammograms or ultrasound. We need to have an awareness, but not maybe the whole month of awareness of breast cancer, but maybe a little more awareness of what metastatic cancer is, because that's the only one that actually kills us. Yes, and out of the entire month, we do get the 13th yeah. to, to highlight uh, metastatic breast cancer here in the United States. Um, 
I always thought that that was somewhat ironic that we were to pick the day that means bad luck, uh, because it is certainly bad luck to get metastatic breast cancer. But I understand it was like one of the only days in October left when there was an initiative to get it um, labeled as National Metastatic Breast Cancer Awareness Month. But um, I still think it's a little ironic. So Stephanie, let's come over to you because you had a de novo diagnosis. You were a hospice nurse, so you had medical training. How was Breast Cancer Awareness Month for you prior to your personal diagnosis? I participated like crazy for years before that. I never knew a person that had it. Um, And I think I got involved because I was a flight nurse at one time and our team was the designated um, help tent or something like that. So from there on, you know, I I volunteered and for, for, you know, the relay for life journeys. And um, I've only done, I think, one Coleman walk. And that was when I was first diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer in 2015. So my first walk was actually in 2016 in New Orleans. I had a sense of cancer um, because treating, you know, pediatric cancers in the pediatric intensive care unit that I understood that I knew that I understood and I couldn't I did everything I was supposed to have done according to everything written um, I had the yearly mammograms I had I checked my boobs I had the husband to check the boobs no just joking um, you know so I I I went back to what um, you know Abigail said dense breasts I was glorified with 44 double d yes I was And so I was always told, you know, you have dense breasts, you have dense breasts. I'm thinking to myself, in the back of my head, I'm thinking, boy, if I ever get breast cancer, they'll never find it in these boobs. So ironically, the mammogram that I did have in June of 2016, um, one of the Oshner facilities in New Orleans had just gotten in their 3D mammogram machine. So there I was. That's how we found mine. I'm 62 years old. And I have been aware, I will say 50 some years now of checking and looking and checking, hanging the little placard in the shower, laying on your back, standing on the showers, doing tiptoes, doing flips, checking the boobs, going to get in the squeeze. And everybody says, you have to dance for half. You know, after a while, you keep going, you keep going. And here I am. And was I angry? No, I'm not, I can't ever say that I was angry. I'm just kind of like, what did I do? And ironically today, today on Facebook, someone posted how many women out there carried their phone in the side of their breast where their breast cancer was diagnosed? Me. I can tell you having a 44D, no pockets, that is the best place to carry a cell phone. Now that sucker falls all the way down to my pants. So it's like, I ain't got nothing there. So, you know, it, 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 it bothers me. I understand the celebration a little bit, but on the flip side, when I try to educate you about my life during Pinktober, don't get mad at me because mine is going to kill me. Period. This month really isn't about me or anyone with metastatic cancer. My mother had had two rounds of breast cancer. So I thought I was fairly well educated through her, through her situations. And the first one was stage two. And then, you know, it was, it was apparent something else was wrong, but she was very stubborn and wouldn't go to the doctor. We finally got her there about one month or two months before my diagnosis, but I, I see it, you know, I was a newbie, so I didn't know anything really about metastatic breast cancer and you think I would with my mother, but it was still a lot of overwhelming information. You know, now the longer that I've been around with it, the balance scale has shifted to where, you know, I'm much more experienced in the metastatic breast cancer world. And I see all of the pain as having really 
nothing to do with with breast cancer, you know, pink isn't switching from treatment to treatment to treatment like I do. Pink isn't having to wear this wig all the time. Pink isn't having to watch friends be sick. Um, I hate this much. I really just need to back off a little bit for my own sanity and attach myself to a different color. Turquoise is nice. Maybe I'll focus on turquoise this month. Christy, I love that. Choosing a color that you prefer that resonates with you. Janice, can we come to you next? Can you tell us a little bit about your story? Well, actually, uh, my early stage diagnosis came in October of 2011. I had no experience personally or professionally with breast cancer prior to my early stage diagnosis no family history. And I was only aware of one of my husband's coworkers who lost their 30 some year old daughter to breast cancer. I didn't even know it was metastatic breast cancer. I just thought breast cancer is breast cancer. And, you know, I worked in pediatrics, but never oncology. So I really didn't have any experience. I had a lot of experience with metastatic cancers. Uh, Both of my parents died from different metastatic cancers Uh, two of my grandparents and all of my uncles and one aunt. So I had a lot of, you know, experience with, with cancer, but I don't think I ever personalized it. Uh, And my, mine was actually missed my, and dismissed Uh, mammogram didn't pick it up because of the location. It was very close to my sternum. And my gynecologist told me that breast cancer is not painful. When I told her about my lump and uh, she couldn't feel it. So anyway, So that was a little bit annoying, but, you know, the only thing when I, as an early stager, I never participated in any uh, activities or walks or anything like that, but I got a lot of pink things from well-intentioned people when I was diagnosed early stage and really what pink represented for me and the pink ribbon, even at the time was just hope it was hope because I was triple negative. It's so aggressive and it has to, you know, tends to have a very high recurrence rate. I was just hopeful that once I finished my early stage treatment, I was done with it. My oncologist thought I was done with it too, because typically with, with triple negative, if it doesn't return within the first five years after early stage treatment, your risk starts going down. And I was right there. So um, what it means to me now is, well, it's a huge annoyance, first of all. As a research advocate, maybe, you know, as a past retired nurse, whatever, I like to educate people. And so whenever I encounter anyone who starts, um, you know, being in denial about uh, what October means and about awareness, I have no issues with the term awareness, none whatsoever. Because awareness is a form of advocacy. It's a matter of educating people about a disease. So awareness isn't just about early stage breast cancer. And we all know that early detection does not prevent metastatic breast cancer. I was very early. So, and people with DCIS will develop metastatic breast cancers. So it's, you know, it it doesn't prevent you from getting metastatic breast cancer just because it's diagnosed early. But In regards to the conversation, yes, this was a social media conversation, and a mutual friend of ours had posted something about just watch, you know, watch where you purchase your your products. If you're going to engage in uh, Breast Cancer Awareness Month, just know where the money goes, know how it's supporting breast cancer patients, and know what percentage of it is going towards research. Right. And that's relevant because we know, I think the stat was like less than 10% of money raised actually goes to metastatic breast cancer research. So what was controversial about the social media post? Someone with early stage jumped on there and basically in a nutshell said, don't uh, take away my survivorship from me. Don't, um, I won. This was my accomplishment and I deserve this. Don't steal this from me. And so I tried to, I guess, redirect the conversation a little bit and and just provide factual information about metastatic breast cancer and that nobody owns the month of October. Awareness doesn't belong to only early stage people. 
but uh, this person became very angry and, uh, you know, eventually left the conversation. But it, it was it was disturbing for me because this is somebody who, as an early stager, feels that October clearly is all about early stage breast cancer and that it's OK, you know, to to deny those who have metastatic breast cancer any recognition uh, to me, it states a lack of support, uh, you know, and and even maybe denial in in the fact that um, as someone who is diagnosed with early stage, you know, she has a 30 percent chance of having a metastatic recurrence. In my mind, I was trying to help educate her and point her out that, you know, regardless of how you look at at October or pink or uh, you know, pink products or activities and so forth. Just be aware. That was my main thing that I was trying to convince her of. Just know where the money goes. Because if you're going to donate during Breast Cancer Awareness Month, make your money count. And only donate if you know that it's going to provide a benefit and services for breast cancer patients or research. There are four stages of, of breast cancer. We may be on one end of the situation, you're on the other end, but we're all going to be affected in different ways. So um, anyway, it was, it was a very illuminating conversation because I certainly have experienced some of the, you know, get away, get away, I'm, you scare me, right? And I don't know if some of the rest of you have experienced that as well, that when you're with people with early stage disease. You know, we talk about the elephant. We're the elephants in the room. We're sitting there saying, wait a minute, this could be you one day. And a lot of people don't want to to think about that. Well, that's exactly why these conversations are just so important. And what I love about this panel is that we are bringing the early stage and the late stage together for this conversation. It's educational. And whether you associate that with fear or anger, emotions aside, it's educational information. So for me, it was all about corporate and doing events and doing fundraising for the organization I worked for at the time. And, you know, putting the pink balloons up and the streamers and putting a walk together through the American Cancer Society and, you know, finding out people that I knew who had breast cancer that I had no idea. They were not metastatic. They were they were early stage, either stage zero, and I didn't even know there was a stage zero um, through two. Um, in fact, there's a woman that I worked with for many years who got fired um, from her job for having breast cancer because she couldn't come in, even though she was using the Family Medical Leave Act. And wow. so, yeah, it was really tough for her and she's still fairly depressed about it and we're going back like four years now so it can really affect people in ways that are I suppose positive but looking back on it now um, I wished I had been more educated about breast cancer and the stages and what people go through before I had put on these massive events you know luncheons and, and all kinds of things and we did it every year then I was diagnosed in 2015. Actually, I was changing careers. I got out of tech because I was just tired of the rat race. And um, I loved making jewelry. And I had gotten an apprenticeship with the best jeweler in San Jose. And it was a very lucrative job. And I'm in the hospital on March 25th. And that's the same day I'm supposed to start my new job. And that tearful call was really tough. Because it's a small place, but I was going to learn all of the difficult things and apprentice and, you know, learn about uh, gems and, and stones and setting them and, you know, just dealing with the public again would have been so nice, you know. And there were a lot of tears from that call from the hospital. Um, and then I think after that, when I got out of the hospital and nothing happened, because a lot of times... And I think all times you get out of the hospital or you get out of your mammogram or you get out of your ultrasound or you get out of your MRI and they dump you back home and they say, we'll be in touch. And they might put you on tamoxifen. And that's exactly what happened to me. And so the fortunate thing was, and I don't know how 
I was so prescient in doing so. But I knew I wouldn't have insurance at the new job, so I had signed up for um, Cover California. Thank God, because it would have been a nightmare trying to cover that first hospital bill. It was up in the, I don't know, $200,000 range. So mm. it's an expensive disease. It's a, it's a, it takes over your entire life. It takes over your entire everything, your whole world. Going back to pinkifying everything. And now if I walk into a store, like Jamba Juice, for instance, um, I'll say to them, so how much of this, what percentage of what you're selling me is going where? What do you mean? Okay, you're supposed to give a percentage of the sale of that smoothie to somebody, and I want to know how much you're going to give, who it's going to go to, and when. And they would stare at me like a deer in the headlights, and I ask everyone, any place I go, Nordstrom, um, the grocery store, um, wherever I am, how much, where, and what? I, I vividly remember my first uh, October and um, the post office. They were selling uh, the stamps with the ribbon on it. Yeah. And I walked in and I was bald because I had just finished chemo. And the lady behind the desk was like, oh, you should really buy these. And I'm like, why? Because I'm bald. Right, right. And, you know, she obviously made the assumption that I had breast cancer. And then I said, okay, I'll make you a deal. I will buy those stamps with the ribbon on it if you can tell me how much money is actually going to research from this. And she couldn't tell me. Yep. And that's been my experience with, with retailers generally is yep. that it's, it's more about them getting the attention yep. and selling things versus a real percentage going anywhere. But Laura, I know you've had the experiences with these brands or companies coming to you as a nonprofit focused on breast cancer, wanting to partner with you or get their information to your constituency. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah, no, thank you. Eileen, you triggered my memory there too when you were speaking about corporate. Thank you, Abigail, for the question. So as running the nonprofit survivingbreastcancer.org, I remember the first year that October came I was elated that people were reaching out. I was like, wow, we're really making it. All these companies want to partner with us. Like, this is really great brand recognition. And I, I was flattered. And then I realized what was actually happening. It's a feel-good moment for them. What was actually happening is that I was reallocating my own resources to help promote someone else's event or someone else's product. And some of the time, the product or the event was this small little window, right? On a Saturday between the hours of 10 and 2, 10% or 20% of proceeds will go and benefit survivingbreastcancer.org. Well, once I realized this, I would just rather reallocate my time and have these amazing conversations with our donors who believe in the work that we are doing and get 100% of the contribution. So there was a little bit of, you know, reflection that I needed to take. Yes, it was flattery. People wanted to work with me. But really, at the end of the day, I had to figure out what they were actually looking for and what that partnership was going to look like. Now, I'm really proud to say that we do have amazing partners this October, that it's a win-win for all parties, actually a win-win-win, not just for us as the nonprofit, but for them as an organization, as a corporation, and then especially for the people that we serve through their financial contribution. So, you know, there are ways to forge these partnerships. It's really just about a matter of really knowing what the margins are and making it fair for everybody. It's not just let's give everyone a pink ribbon and move on. This October, we are working with many companies who are supporting our mission and programs and services, one being Amona. They make fabulous products and have a wide selection of products, including prosthetics, bras, swimsuits, and bras specifically for those of us who've been diagnosed with breast cancer, where there's going to be pockets for prosthetics, uh, bras that do not have underwire or um, anything that would be irritating our scars. They also have a larger band where things would sit underneath your breast. They have front closure bras, front slip up bras. Oh my gosh, but the list can go on. So they are amazing. And they're partnering with survivingbreastcancer.org. So if you're familiar with our nonprofit, you know exactly where the money is going to all of our programs and services. 
And our second organization that we're working with is called Madame Glam. They actually have removed 21 toxic chemicals from their nail polish. And all month long, if you buy their Pink October nail polish color, they will be donating to survivingbreastcancer.org as well. So yes, we definitely want to know where the money is going. And I am here to share that there are definitely some amazing organizations out there to support this mission. That's such a great comment that partnerships take on very different um, characteristics. And uh, you realize over time that a true partnership, it looks a little different from somebody who's just trying to get some some marketing out there. Um, But just as much as we're talking about metastatic breast cancer being the elephant in the room, I want to go to Meg and Stephanie to talk about um, whatever you feel like sharing in terms of the fact that there are differences among people of color um, or people from different places looking at at the month and the the pink and all of that. Um, So Meg, would you like to talk about just in in your experience that that women of color often look at pink differently or look at the, the celebrations a little bit differently? Well, I can only tell you my personal experience just because I've always kind of straddled between the two worlds of white and black and don't really fit in anywhere. And that even goes down to the type of cancer I've had. So for me, and I think black women who do not have a cancer that is prevalent within the black community, we get questioned a lot. Um, I remember I specifically went to um, an organization, they're actually five minutes away from me, um, for support. And you had to write down what your cancer diagnosis was. And I wrote down invasive lobular. And she goes, are you sure you have invasive lobular? And I'm thinking to myself, can she not read my my printing here? And, and I was, it was literally October um, because I started chemo. In fact, my chemoversary, the first day I ever started chemo was October 2nd, uh, yesterday. And I was like, okay, you know, so I went back with the intake form, finishing it. She goes, okay, I see you have invasive lobular on here. Are you sure you don't have triple negative? And I'm just like, okay, what part of like, like what is going on here? And at that moment I spoke up and I got really angry and I was like, why are you trying to box me here? Cancer is big. It is scary. This is bigger than me. And because I was like, obviously you're seeing me as a black patient and not just a, a cancer patient who's coming to you for help and who's scared half to death and doesn't know what's going on here. And it was really that moment that kind of set the tone for me that once, I think something clicked, like once I got through this, I would eventually start speaking about this. But I remember I caught, like if I was still upset two weeks later, I said, I would call the executive director. And I did, and I said, you know what? You need to talk with your people and teach them about diversity. And instead of just looking at me and just seeing my color, like realizing, hey, I'm a mix of a lot of stuff. And just because I happen to be this particular shade that you are calling black, doesn't mean I'm gonna have the black cancer. And I think that's a, to me, a big problem with, breast cancer awareness because they're not even like stating that like yes we know that black women are um proportion you know unproportionately dying and the stats are horrific because of late diagnosis um and not getting the treatment needed but it's very you rarely see our faces in the marketing campaigns you rarely see our you rarely hear our stories about what's really going on and to me when I think about this pink Tober month and the pink washing and all of that, as someone who's an early stager, I was like, we're not educating uh, black women and other people of color about metastatic, about like the hard, the hardness of this disease. We're still making it look easy. And so I feel that it's giving those mixed messages of like, Oh, you don't need to worry about it. You'll be fine. And so that's really how I can speak about it. It's really from my personal point of view, just because it's, I straddle between the worlds. And what about you, Stephanie? What has your experience been? Well, obviously I am a black woman. Um, and I do, um, as many people have told me, I have the easy cancer, you know, um, hormone positive, ERPR positive, HDR2 negative. And that's the easy kind. If you're going to have the cancer, if you're going to have breast cancer, that's the best to have. I haven't actually found that silver's lining yet, right? Yeah, hmm. it's the best. You know, I, I never realized that there was a big difference 
there was diversity. There was issues with um, black and versus white when it comes to breast cancer until last year. And I'm not saying that I had blinders on. Um, I have been working as a nurse for 40 years and there's times my profession, um, I've been the only black or, you know, that kind of thing. So it's not like I have the blinders on it, but I didn't know anything about metastatic breast cancer. And to be that right out of the gate, I felt like that I failed myself because I should have done something different. And as a black woman, a lot of the times we feel like that, you know, we take that personally, we have done something wrong or we didn't take care of our health. And when it comes to um, knowing about breast cancer, you know, we have to educate ourselves. And when I say educate ourselves, not only myself, but people that look like me, I have to educate. And that's not easy. And that truly is truly is not easy where I live. And 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 I'm not saying it's a North Carolina thing. It's just that I'm a come here. And if I lived in a place where I lived and grew up and was diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer and that kind of thing, it would be easier for me to fit into that community. But it's harder to fit into a community in which I have only been living here since 2017 full time to to grasp that black community um, because we have that trust. Um, even doing my my survey that I did that called Become with Metastatic Breast Cancer Alliance that focused on black men and women with metastatic breast cancer in clinical trials. I am just amazed that, you know, everybody still brings up the past. And I I will not ever deny that the things in the past happened. They're in the past. That's why they call it the past, the past. And I, I understand it will affect and it has affected us going forward. But I don't think we are going to ever go forward if we keep bringing up what's back there in the past. We've got to deal with it put it to bed, and go forward. Is breast cancer something that is spoken about? Do parents and grandparents talk about it if they were diagnosed? They don't talk about it. Black older women don't talk about it, didn't talk about it, you know, having breast cancer to anybody, you know, even their families. I've seen that in the ER. Women come in, their breast is excoriated. I mean, it's all open and everything. They've had metastatic breast cancer, but she still went to church every Sunday and played the piano, but her family had no idea. So we need to be a little bit more open, a little bit more vocal about it. Um, We don't need to sugarcoat it because last time I got my injection of fossil necks in the ass, nobody sugarcoated it. It hurt like hell. I still cry and and it's over. You know what I mean? You can't sugarcoat metastatic breast cancer. No way, no way, no, no. You can't cut it to make it look better. It's just our fact of life. We have to live with it. If we can educate the early stagers to realize that 30% of you chicks are going to end up like me one day, not trying to be fearful or trying to scare you, but just to put that thought in the back of your mind to get to the point to where you know your body and know what's different. Thank you, Stephanie. We did all the walks and we did all the pink stuff and she walked in fashion shows and we did all of the awareness stuff. And then when I was diagnosed with metastatic disease in 2017, we realized that so many of those things that we did didn't have the impact that we thought they were having. Christy, did you have some of those experiences as well? Yes, absolutely. You you know, it's, it's a feel good moment to make you feel like you're doing something positive. And at the time, my there was one year my whole class of second graders formed a team for me and they walked and some of their parents walked and you know you talk about special moments and making it count and making it matter I think on one level I was doing something bigger than just the race for the cure because I was teaching those children, you know, kind of how to be advocates in a sense and take charge and do something with the situation and try to make it better. So I think that was a really valuable lesson for them all. But in terms of putting money where I had hoped that it would be going, That was a disappointment, a huge disappointment. 
Victoria, I was hoping you might talk about, you know, in the Jewish community, how there's such a prevalence of, of Braqa, especially among Ashkenazi. The fact is that I had no idea that the Braqa mutation was prevalent in, uh, in my ethnic group because I didn't know what Braqa mutation was. I'm not part of the uh, Hasidic or the Orthodox community, even though I'm ethnically Jewish. I, uh, I don't belong to, uh, to those close-knit communities. And there are some major, major issues with those communities because even though they are um, uh, they quite open to being treated and health care mm-hmm. and getting the best, they don't talk about it. It is considered dangerous, actually, to talk about it because that would affect your marriage options. And so I think it's changing now, but in the past, they stayed away from the information like BRCA or any other gen- genetic predisposition to having anything averse because that would be a would be a problem get, for you to get married. I'm always amazed at these women that they have no idea that they have metastatic cancer. They have no idea sometimes that they have breast cancer. So, you know, it is a, it's a, it is a great problem. And Sharsharet started as an organization to help the Orthodox community. I think they've uh, broadened their scope quite a bit lately, but it's still, it's, it's a group of people that is a minority, and it it has a very aggressive type of cancer, and they need to be educated for sure. Eileen, what has your experience been? I um, have not really had a lot of um, specific to the Ashkenazi Jewish background that I have, except that it is assumed that I have BRCA, the BRCA mutation. That would be an assumption that made gets made constantly. In fact. Megan Clare and I actually wrote um, two blog posts that were very similar. And we kind of backed each other up, which is just because I'm Ashkenazi Jewish, just because I'm Black, doesn't mean these things are true. And that is racist. That is generally not something you should do because everybody is different. I wanted to go around the room one more time um, here and just ask for your, your final thoughts about this, this topic or about how you are um, engaging with Breast Cancer Awareness Month this year. My word for this conversation is respect others' differences. We are all going to approach hard things different ways and respecting the fact that we're, we may each respond to things a little bit differently is so key. We are different. Different doesn't mean wrong. I'm one of the producers on the Our NBC Live podcast. It's a very special podcast. It's uh, it's about by and for metastatic breast cancer patients. And um, this year, just like last year, on uh, October, well, on or around October 13th, we're going to do a very very special episode in remembrance. And we did it last year. It was, I think, one of our best podcasts. And this year we're going to go, we we will do it again. So I'm, I'm asking all of you, and I'm sure every single one of you has people, friends, family members who are no longer with us. So if you want to, if you want their memories to be heard by others, please reach out to us at ourmbclive.org and leave either a voice message or an email, whatever you like, to, uh, to let us know who, whom you want to remember. So my word, I guess my word for this thing is please remember. I, I think when I said I wanted a break, that was very, very true. But even in just processing this last question, doing Victoria's thing would bring me joy. I think that would be a wonderful way to remember my mom. Um, There's something that I shared with you at lunch that I want to do that I think would bring me a lot of joy. (laughs) 
<laughs> that I think would be rather funny. Um, because I know at some point I'm going to get triggered this month and I will likely lash out at that point, either online or offline. And um, I'd, I'd like to try to keep focused on the one or two things that might make this month easier and more enjoyable for me. I think my word or words would just be open and open conversations. Um, I've benefited from listening to all of the women here today and your perspectives and appreciate all of the knowledge that I don't have. So, so thank you. As an early stager, my, my last words would be, you know, I still celebrate um, because it was really hard to get to my quote unquote survivorship stage. And I'm not going to minimize that. Um, I solve a lot of issues uh, post cancer now. Um, that is something that I was not aware of uh, that could possibly happen with quality of life. And so what I say, what my word would be to listen, and this is a message directly to hopefully early stagers who will look at this and say, you know, yes, it is scary, but I think it's important. And yes, you celebrate that you you got to, you know, if you made it to the survivorship stage, that is great, but also listen and be aware that it's not over yet. In fact, it's never really over and that's a scary thing. And so I think you have to be open to like acknowledging that hard truth that once you do get breast cancer, that you still are at risk. Even if you are no evidence of disease, I like to say I want to be in a long-term relationship with Ned, but I don't know how long-term that will be. Um, and to just recognize and really educate yourself, but most of all, listen, because the metastatic community is not trying to scare you. They're trying to let you know this is the reality and it is scary and it's horrible. And my friends are dying. Y'all, you know, so just listen and be open to it. And the MedStack community, we need to include them. And they're not trying to make you feel bad for wearing pink or being excited. Because as you see, I've got pink on right now. It is my signature color. Uh, even before um, breast cancer, I had tiaras and pink bellas way ahead of that. Um, because that's just me. But I think it's important. And I feel that might be the way to maybe bring the early stage community and the NBC community together and recognizing that there is still this fear from the early stagers. And we need to just understand that that train, that's why I call my blog, I'm going to do a plug, Life on the Cancer Train at warriormexi.com because <laughs> I realized I, met, I realized there was no final destination. I thought it was over. And then I really got educated and understood about the NBC community. I was like, wow, it really isn't over. I always say that I'm still dancing with Ned and <laughs> he's the best dance partner ever, but, but he's not always loyal. So I understand he could leave me anytime. Um, you know, looking at um, October, I, you know, I will continue doing what I love doing. I am someone who is empowered by knowledge. So what I will do every day of October is I will continue to post facts about metastatic breast cancer, because in my opinion, it's extremely important for everybody, whether you've ever experienced breast cancer or not, to understand, uh, you know, and have information about what it is. So I will do that, but I'm combining that this year. I'm also posting a photo with each one of my facts a day of someone that was very near and dear to my heart that I have lost uh, to this disease because it's important for me to continue. They were all advocates and it's important for me to continue, um, you know, as their voice because their voices have been silenced. Never take hope away from anybody at any given time during their lives, their lives with metastatic breast cancer, their lives with early stage cancer. Never take hope. It's not up to anybody to take that from a patient. Thank you. I love, I feel like we've got like this amazing tribe of like resources, education, plugs, surveys, content. So you guys are all amazing. I wanted to just quickly scroll through my phone too, because we've been having a lively conversation on Facebook as well. And so 
Um, you know, some of their words that are resonating from today's conversation, for example, include live your life one day at a time. And then someone else posted living with not dying from. So I wanted to share that. So I just have to say thank you all for taking the time to be on this panel, for sharing your personal experiences, to talk about pink culture, October, Breast Cancer Awareness Month, Action Month, Advocacy Month, all the A words you can think of, how we are really needing to come together early stage and late stage. So thank you for this very enriching conversation. You all are part of so many amazing communities. So I will link to all of your blogs, podcasts, all of the amazing organizations you guys are associated with in the show notes below. So thank you very much. And thank you all for listening and tuning in week after week here on Breast Cancer Conversations. Please be mindful that all of our content and information is for educational purposes only and is never a substitute for medical advice. Until next time, keep on thriving.